I think we're getting this Easter thing, okay? It, it sounds like it. So uh, you remember the greeting, Christ is, risen. Christ is risen. There you go, okay. I need to hear a few more male voices in that, okay? Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Yeah, they're the guys for me. That's great. That is great. So um, uh, several years ago, uh, Cindy and I had a boat. We don't have a boat now. But uh, before we uh, bought that boat, I never imagined that we would have a boat. And, and the reason is because I had a couple experiences growing up. And uh, both of those experiences were like, well, they terrified me, okay, when I got close to a boat. So I just thought, no more of that in life, you know, two, two strikes and that's it for me, you know, you're out of there. So, and, and then adding to that um, was kind of how I was raised up as well. Um, my mother... Uh, is still to this day deathly afraid of being anywhere near the water, okay? And I know the story because I've only heard it about a hundred times. She's still traumatized by what happened probably 65 years ago. Um, my father and his best friend and my mom, and th they went out to the lake. And uh, the way my dad tells the story is, um, I got your mother into the water, I think my mother's side of the story is a bit different than that. My dad and his best friend threw her into the lake. The only problem being she doesn't know how to swim, okay? And she thought that day that she was going to drown, okay? So after that experience, she created and maintained a pretty intense resistance to any activity having to do with water. So... The thought of putting her young boys in a boat on a large lake was rather unnerving and unbearable for her. But it happened. It happened at Lake Okaboji in northern Iowa when I was about eight or nine years old. My dad borrowed a friend's boat, loaded up the family for what would be only one of a couple of vacations that I remember when we were growing up. Now, my dad was always courageous. So the fact that he had no experience with boats was not a big deal to him. The boat was launched into the lake as my mother stood on the bank. You can imagine the sense of panic and anxiety that was racing through her at that moment. Even at that young age, I could tell it was very difficult for her to watch her husband and three young boys slowly motor out onto the lake. We were almost out of this large bay, ready to enter into the, the main lake, and uh, someone on the boat noticed that water was pouring into the back of the boat. Now, while the water rose deeper and deeper inside the boat, that allowed the boat to sink lower and lower into the water. My father had become so focused on getting the boat out into the main lake that he had failed to focus on something that was right in front of him. My father failed to focus on putting the plug in the boat before putting the boat in the water. Now, if my mother could have seen what was happening in the boat at that moment, she would have walked on water to get out there and give my dad a what for, okay? You know, I learned an important lesson, life lesson that day age of eight or nine, imagine that, that if you focus on the wrong things, eventually you're going to sink. That's a life lesson. You see, the challenge is we often get so excited or so passionate or so disappointed or so hurt that our focus narrows down to just one thing. And often that one thing upon which we become focused is not life-giving. Now here's the good news. The good news is our soul work can help us to refocus upon the thing that is most important. Mary Magdalene did not sleep all night. She didn't sleep all night. You can't sleep when grief is deep and loss is profound. All she can do is dry her tears on her pillow make a mental list of all the things she needs to do tomorrow and pray that the Lord God will relieve the aching deep in her heart. At some point in the dark night, there's no need to toss and turn any longer. 
And so Mary gets up before sunrise. Her mind is so kind of muddled with all the sadness that she struggles to remember that list of things she wanted to do that she rehearsed so many times in the night. But in spite of it all, Mary continues to gather up the things that she thinks she needs. And then before anyone else gets out of bed, she leaves the house with her arms full of supplies. She walks slowly, but mindlessly, down the dark path. Finally, Mary arrives at the place where Jesus was buried three days before. She looks up, and the horizon is beginning to brighten just a little with the lavenders and the blues and the pinks of the sun not quite risen. After bending over to put her things down, she rises up to see the stone in front of the tomb rolled a bit over to the side. Mary has come to do the final preparations of Jesus' body. But now she fears that the body's been taken away, that it's not even there. You see, Mary's entire focus is on the tomb. And the top item on her to-do list is to prepare Jesus' body for its final resting place. Mary is so focused on death that she does not realize that life is standing right behind her. When he speaks, she turns around. Her focus changes. Now Mary is focused on something other than that which hurts or hinders. But it's only for a few moments. She rather quickly turns away to face the empty tomb again. Her focus is on the things that do not go her way. Her focus is on the things that she thought might go another way. Disappointment, fear, sadness, those grab hold of her full attention. But life calls out to Mary a second time. Again, she turns around and refocuses. There's something deep in her soul that longs for more than sadness or loneliness or hopelessness. This time, there's more conversation. However, Mary is still not able to maintain her focus on life. She slowly turns her attention back to the empty tomb and to the emptiness in her own soul. Finally, life calls her by name. Mary, she turns again and recognizes that life is found in Jesus. It takes three turnarounds before Mary can refocus her soul and her life on the risen Christ. However, when Mary does refocus, she discovers that love is real, joy is deep, and peace is possible. Mary runs to hug Jesus' neck and be close to Jesus' heart. Mary's life is transformed when her focus is on the risen Christ. Our soul work can help us refocus on real life through the risen Christ. The challenge is we often get so excited or hurt or passionate or disappointed that our focus narrows down to just one thing. The one thing that is most important gets pushed to the side by the many things that are less important. The song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, invites us to keep our focus on the glory and the grace of the risen Jesus. The composer, Helen Limmel, reminds us that when our focus is on Jesus, our tiredness and our troubles will seem to grow smaller and smaller. Listen to a few of the words of the song. O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see? There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It was important for Mary to make the final preparations of Jesus' body. But the most important thing for Mary to know that Jesus had risen from death to life. And when she becomes more and more focused on the risen Christ, it's much easier for her to believe that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is with her, and that Jesus loves her. 
We are all looking for the one thing that is going to lead us into real life. Not something superficial or artificial, but real life. We're all looking for that one thing. But although we're looking for real life, we're often focused upon the things that will not deliver what we desire most. This was Mary's struggle, and it's our struggle oftentimes too. So Jesus helps Mary to refocus her heart and her mind and her soul on the risen Christ. In in the text which Emerald read for us, there's multiple times where Jesus helps Mary refocus on him. In verse 15, it's, it's stated in this way. Jesus asks Mary, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Jesus knew that Mary was looking in the wrong places for real life. So he invited her over and over and over to refocus her life, her heart, her mind, her soul onto him. Easter proclaims that through faith in Jesus, we can have real life, abundant life, and even the assurance of eternal life. Because Jesus is risen, we can know that Jesus is always with us and that Jesus loves us. So I invite you to engage in the kind of soul work that will help you refocus every day on the risen Christ, his amazing love, his immeasurable power, his immense wisdom, his awesome beauty, and his glory that has no match. I invite you to refocus upon the living Lord, our Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Jesus, there's not a single one of us here today, no matter how faithful, how long we have loved you, how often we serve you, there's not a single one of us here who is not like Mary. Every single one of us is tempted day in and day out to shift our focus to the things we believe are urgent or necessary or important. And so often, Lord, those things don't match with reality. The reality is you are the most important one the most important thing. And so I pray that on this day, Heavenly Father, you would help each and every one of us to refocus, to make that commitment right now, to refocus our hearts, our minds, our souls, our lives on you. Let all the other things that occupy our mind and our time Let all the things that reside deep in our heart that are unresolved, let all of these things come just after you, not before you. Heavenly Father, this has been your desire since the beginning of time to have us close to your heart and full of your love. And so at the right time, you sent your son Jesus from from heaven to earth to live and love so that we might learn how to live and love like him. And then as we have celebrated in this week, he not only lived in love, but he suffered and died. In his death, we have the possibility of forgiveness, the possibility again that you would invite us back to refocus on you. But the cross was not the end of the story. By the power of your love, Heavenly Father, you raised Jesus from death to life to give us hope, to fill us with joy, 
to give us an abundant, amazing life now and eternal life in heaven. We thank you that he lives with us today. Focus is so hard. And so Jesus gathered his closest disciples to him and they shared a meal together in a house in Jerusalem. And during their meal, Jesus lifted up some bread and he broke the bread and he gave thanks to you, Heavenly Father, and then he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And they all ate together. A little later, Jesus lifted up a cup of wine and again he gave, he gave thanks to you, Father. And then he said, take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. He did this so that they would remember him. That they would focus on him every day. Every time they ate a meal, they would remember. And they would turn their eyes upon Jesus. So we pray that as we share in the loaf and the cup today, Lord God, that, that you would make them become for us the body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, but also to deepen our desire to focus our heart, our mind, and our soul, our whole life on you, Jesus. So bless this time of worship. Fill us with your grace. Give us the courage and the faith to ask you to fill our heart again. To be our Savior so that we might serve you as our Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.